I wish to remind you that next week we are going to take all the chips and uh, logic gates that we've built in previous weeks of uh, this course and we are going to assemble them together into a unified hardware platform which we call the, the HEC computer. Now, in order to set up to this uh, very engaging and interesting uh, uh, construction work, we decided that this week we have to give you a good overview of what is it exactly that you're going to build. And that's uh, one reason why we decided to explore all these notions of low-level programming, uh, the hack assembly language, and the hack hardware, because at this very low level of operation, everything is tightly coupled. When you build a computer, you have to think about its uh, instruction set. When you design the machine language or the instruction set, you have to think about the computer. There's no way to avoid it. So, um, uh, once again, the purpose of, uh, of uh, this week was, well, first of all, to expose you to uh, low-level programming, but we also wanted to give you uh, a feeling of, uh, of the hardware platform that you're actually going to implement uh, in the next week. And um, this is also the purpose of, uh, of Project 4. In Project 4, uh, you will write two programs that... Uh, will let you put your hands on, on the hardware and, and program it in a, in a very low level, in, in a level which is almost uh, uh, connected to the uh, machine. So we'll do this um, by writing two relatively simple uh, programs. The first program will affect some algebraic uh, manipulation, and the second program will uh, interact with the user uh, operating on uh, both the screen and the keyboard. All right, so uh, without further ado, uh, here is the first program, which is called uh, MALT. And the purpose of this program is to compute the product or the multiplication of R0 and R1. So uh, here's a screenshot of uh, this program uh, executing in uh, the CPU emulator. In fact, it's a screenshot of uh, the end of uh, this uh, program's uh, execution. If you look carefully at the top of uh, the RAM, you will see that uh, RAM 0 is 6, RAM 1 is uh, 7, and RAM 2 is 42. And that's exactly what this program is supposed to do, to multiply the first two uh, registers in the memory and uh, compute uh, and, 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 and place uh, the product of these two numbers in uh, RAM 2. So the assumption is that once the user has loaded this program into the data memory. Uh, into the instruction memory, the user also places two numbers in uh, RAM 0 and RAM, RAM uh, 1, clicks the uh, Go uh, button or the Play button, uh, starts praying, and if everything works nicely, uh, the program will compute uh, the product of these two numbers. On the right-hand side, in the screen area, um, we see a script that uh, we supply together with this uh, uh, project and the script is designed to uh, to test the program using some pairs of numbers that uh, um, that we made up and obviously you can explore the script as well in order to see what kind of tests uh, we are going to subject your program uh, to and uh, you know this is maybe also the place to point out that uh, in the simulator in, in, in the CPU emulator we use the screen as sort of a multi-purpose device uh, sometimes it works as a, a real physical screen, sometimes we use it as a window to display our test scripts and, test scripts and, and so on. All right, so uh, once again in this area you see the input, uh, the two inputs and uh, the output of the program and uh, I guess the question uh, that uh, burns uh, right now is how do we write such a program? Well, um, recall that um, the, the heck uh, machine language doesn't have a multiplication uh, operation. Uh, all we have is addition and subtraction. So we are faced with a challenge of uh, expressing a multiplication operation using uh, uh, addition and subtraction. Um, I don't think that I have to say much more than this. I can give you perhaps only one more hint. You will have to use a loop. And uh, using this uh, loop, you will somehow uh, compute the, uh, uh, the result. Uh, by the way, 
those of you who will uh, choose to take part two of this course, uh, NAND to Tetris part two, will also go through the process of developing an operating system. And uh, one thing that uh, our operating system is going to deliver, to deliver is, uh, is a math uh, library that features all sorts of uh, mathematical operations. And one of these mathematical operations is going to be multiply. And uh, uh, the multiplication algorithm that we will use in the operating system is extremely uh, efficient and uh, something that we don't expect you to do in this exercise. Uh, in this exercise, we simply expect you to uh, somehow multiply the two numbers and you know, maybe you can try to do it uh, as, as efficiently as you can, but uh, uh, we don't expect you to get out of your way and come up with some uh, uh, very fancy algorithms to to carry out multiplication. All right, so this is uh, the first assignment. And uh, the second assignment is to write uh, a simple interactive program that uh, performs the following operation. Uh, this program listens to the keyboard. And as long as the user does nothing with the keyboard, nothing happens. But once the user touches a key on the keyboard, any key, you know, once you touch a key, look what happens. Uh, the program blackens the screen completely. And once you lift your finger from the keyboard, the screen becomes again uh, clear. You put your finger again on any key on the keyboard, the, key, uh, the screen becomes black. You take your, uh, uh, you take your finger away the screen becomes clear. That's what this program is doing. It is going through some, some sort of an infinite loop that uh, listens to the keyboard all the time and acts accordingly. So actually we have here two uh, separate uh, uh, challenges. One of them is to probe uh, the keyboard and understand what the, you know, whether or not any key is pressed. And uh, uh, the other challenge is to uh, be able to blacken the screen or whiten the screen, which is essentially the same operation. In one, we write uh, a certain value to the memory map, and uh, in the other operation, we, we write some other value. What makes this exercise uh, somewhat easy is the fact that we operate on the entire uh, memory map. So we don't have to be picky and uh, select uh, certain pixels to turn on and off. We simply sort of a shotgun approach. We either turn on all the pixels or turn off all the pixels. So in that respect, uh, the program is, uh, is not terribly complicated. And in general, it's not, it's not really uh, uh, a terribly uh, complicated program. But it's kind of fun. You know, it allows you to see how you, you can control peripheral devices using a, a standard uh, hack uh, machine language code. All right, so um, here is the general implementation strategy. Uh, listen to the keyboard. Uh, to blacken or clear the screen, we write code that fills the entire screen memory map with white or black pixels. And uh, in order to do this, we have to address every register in the memory map. And we do it using uh, some sort of a loop that works with pointers in a very similar way to what we did in, uh, in the previous uh, unit when we discussed uh, pointers uh, manipulation. So you really have all the uh, firepower that you need in order to, to implement this uh, particular program. Uh, in order to test this program on the CPU emulator, make sure that uh, the no animation uh, selection is, uh, is selected and also we cannot provide uh, a test script that uh, tests this uh, program, or, or we can, but we, we thought that it will be uh, uh, too, com too complicated. So you simply have to test it uh, as I did, uh, demonstrated, you know, put your finger down, put your finger up, and hope that uh, the screen will be blackened or whitened and so on. Uh, you can also think, if you want, you can think about some fancy ways to blacken or whiten the screen, you know, instead of, uh, going line by line, you, went, you may want to go column by column, you, went, you may want to create some, uh, uh, this, this will be uh, quite challenging to create some growing, uh, you know, uh, swirls, I don't know. You can use your imagination, do whatever you want in order to blacken or whiten the screen, and, uh, and that's actually 
um, uh, what is uh, expected from you in, uh, in this particular program. All right, uh, I want to describe some uh, uh, general uh, things about the overall program development uh, process uh, or cycle uh, when you want to write programs in the HEC uh, uh, machine language. Uh, first of all, your programs are going to reside uh, within regular text files that you can write with any uh, text editor. So you invoke your favorite uh, text editor, you write the program, you save it using the extension ASM, and by convention, uh, we give our programs uh, names that begin with capital letters. So you give it a name, .asm, and then you uh, load this program as is into the CPU emulator. As I explained before, the CPU emulator has this very nice service that when you load the program, it automatically translates the program into uh, binary code. So uh, you can next uh, run the program uh, on the CPU emulator and ask yourself if you're uh, satisfied with the results. If so, you are done. You can submit the program uh, to us. And if you are unsatisfied with the program, which will be probably the case uh, uh, in the first few iterations of uh, debugging, then you, you fix the program. You look for errors and you uh, uh, fix the errors and you fix them by going back into the uh, text editor, you know, working in the editor, saving the program again, reloading it into the CPU emulator and so on. So it's quite um, convenient to have two windows opened on, on your screen at the same time, a text editor here, CPU emulator there, and you can easily you know, move between the two, uh, but don't forget to load your updated program uh, after you, uh, you fix it. Um, the error diagnostics of uh, the CPU emulator is quite primitive. So uh, when you load the program into uh, the CPU emulator, if there's a syntax error in this program, the CPU emulator will simply refuse to load it. It will issue some uh, cryptic error message, uh, something like, um, uh, oh, it will give you some very important information. It will give you the line number where the error occurred and the first error that was found. And then you can go into this line number and, uh, and fix the problem. And um, once you, you are done with the, with the syntax uh, errors, well, then the real problems begin. You know, these are the runtime errors, which are much harder to detect. And uh, uh, you typically detect them by watching the execution of your program, seeing that something does not work properly. And then once again, you have to go through the same cycle and fix your program until it works uh, to your satisfaction. So this is the general uh, uh, mechanics of uh, developing a program uh, using a, a CPU emulator and uh, a text editor. And as you see, it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, uh, simple and friendly. All right, uh, finally, I want to say a few words about uh, best practice and advice on do's and, do and don'ts. Uh, there's no reason really to think about uh, machine la language programs as some sort of a, a strange animal. It's yet another example of uh, a programming uh, artifact. And all the principles that applied to writing programs in a high level language also apply at the low level. We expect your programs to be short or not unnecessarily long. They should be short, they should be efficient, they should be elegant and they should be self-describing. So we expect you to document the programs, but do it uh, 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 by using some judgment. You know, don't over-document the program. Uh, the best, I think, uh, uh, thing to do is simply to look at our examples and to follow something uh, similar. So, you know, typically uh, uh, we use some high-level uh, operation to describe uh, you know, we start a comment, we write uh, something like here we're going to say if i is greater than n, go to, and then we write the six or seven uh, instructions in machine code that actually uh, implement this, uh, this uh, semantics. Now, um, here are some uh, very important technical tips that will make your life uh, uh, easier. First of all, you must use symbolic variables and labels. You know, otherwise your programs will be helplessly 
and hopelessly uh, complex and, uh, and cryptic. So if you want to go to somewhere in your program, use a label. If you want to store something repetitively, make up a variable name. So when you're done writing the program, you know, look at it and make sure that you don't see any actual addresses there. You have to make sure that everything is symbolic. You know, this is one very important virtue of well-written uh, uh, machine language, language uh, uh, programs. When you invent your variables and your labels, as usual in programming, use sensible names. You know, don't make cryptic names like GU5, uh, 3% uh, uh, or something like this. Use instead something like loop, end, stop, positive, negative. You know, depending on what is it that you want to do, try to use sensible uh, label names and likewise variable names. You know, use nice names like I, M, sum, count, and, and so on. Now, when you uh, uh, declare or, or when you use these variable names, use lowercase for variables and uppercase for labels. If you go back to our program examples, you will see that all the labels, you know, typically words like end and stop were uppercase, and all the variables, i, n, x, y, and so on, were lowercase. If you follow this convention, which is not required, by the way, you know, it's, it's not something that, they, that the uh, assembler uh, cares about, but if you use this convention, you will have a very easy time for yourself to distinguish between variables and labels. So when you see an et command, when, an a command, when we see something like et sum, if the sum is lowercase, you know it's a variable. If it's an uppercase, you know that uh, we mean to go to a label called uh, sum. Uh, and uh, finally, use indentation. Um, once again, follow the examples that uh, we gave uh, in the previous units and make sure that your program are good looking and easy to read. And it's always recommend, recommended to start with pseudocode. Writing machine level code is always challenging and uh, your life will be much easier if you first you know, make up um, uh, the program or write the program using some, some sort of a high level uh, language that you can make up for yourself or once again follow our examples once the program works nicely uh, in pseudocode, and this is something that you have to, to check on, on a piece of paper, you can then translate it into machine language and continue the debugging process. All right, uh, where do you find uh, everything you need? Well, as usual, you go to the NAND to Tetris uh, website, uh, you look at project four, all the files that you need for this uh, exercise are uh, described in, uh, for this project, I'm sorry, are described in, uh, in this uh, web page. And there's no need to download anything because if you downloaded the software suite at the beginning of the course, you now have on your personal computer, you have a directory called project slash 04. And this directory already uh, uh, contains all the files that you have to use and, uh, and manipulate in, uh, in project four. So this has been uh, the, uh, uh, the unit in which we, uh, we hopefully gave you some tips on how to, uh, how to write the, the programs in Project 4. And uh, we now go on to the last unit in this uh, week uh, in which we reflect on uh, what we did uh, uh, during the entire week.